blood is the means of our salvation and the power for our daily living. And we thank God for that this evening. We'll take the word of God with me and go back to Luke 12 this evening. And the Lord began to speak unto his disciples here, and he's giving them many lessons as we get into Luke 12. And, and of course, we've gotten an extra dose of it today. Not only did I preach a really long sermon this morning, um, but we also have been reading through this chapter all day. And uh, I'm glad I, I, I needed, a, needed the sermon to be long enough to get to that encouraging part there for me in verse 6 and 7. Thank God for the meaning of verse 6 and 7, and verse six and seven, the fact that God has not forgotten any of us, not even, not even the fifth sparrow, <laughs> not even the fifth sparrow. God is, God is there. No reason to, to hide things from God. He loves us. He knows right where we're at, and there's no reason to fear anything but God who can condemn us to hell. And if we come to him by the way of the cross and by the blood of Jesus, that is off the table. Thank God, because I'm saved. I'm never going to hell. I'm not going there. And if you know the Lord, you're not, and you're not either, and we thank God for that. The Lord continues to speak uh, to his beloved disciples there in the midst of this huge throng of people. He's taking his effort to uh, train them and help them for his departure and the fact that they will be standing on their own with the help, thank God, of the Holy Spirit. We'll see that at the very end of this passage in just a moment as we get to verse 12. Look here with me. We'll pick up with our reading in verse 8 this evening, if you don't mind. Jesus again speaking, says, I also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, take you no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. Jesus made this statement here, back, or this statement is given to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I should say, here in verse 1 of chapter 12. In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of the people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples. He began to say unto his disciples. Uh, we did the first part of that this morning, the second part this evening. The next time I speak from this passage, I believe will be next Sunday morning, we'll see another part of it that's very important and the parable of the rich fool that ties into all of it. But tonight, look at what he's saying here. Don't fear, verse 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, don't fear publicly professing your faith in the Messiah. Don't, don't, don't. Beware uh, if you are struggling with that. Now, we all have one, some level of fear about speaking out for the Lord and speaking up for the Lord, witnessing to people. I talk to people of that from time to time. Pastor, I want to do this, but I, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Well, I want you to know that that nervousness never completely goes away. If you, if you go witnessing regularly, you would say amen to that, right? You know that never really ever goes away. And why should it? You're talking to people about life and death. Yep. You're talking to people about the most important thing you could talk to them about. And we you know we're, we're talking to people about something they may not want to think about. Uh, that, that's, that's certainly possible because if you have a, a fear about ending the life you can see and taking up the life you can't see, uh, that's, that's a legitimate concern for people who don't know the Lord. My goodness, it's a, it's a concern for those of us that do, right? And as we think about speaking up for the Lord, that's what the Lord is saying to these men. And again, he's talking to men who have been called to be with him, men that he's called especially and appointed them uh, to walk and talk with him, by the way, on this three-and-a-half-year journey of ministry training. It's kind of a, a mobile Bible college they had, that Jesus had here, training these men. And, and, of course, Judas is still in this crowd. Not everybody passed the final exam, did they? Not everybody got it done. But the Lord is pouring himself into him here, and he's saying things to them. You think, does he have to talk like this to this committed group of people? Oh, yes, yes, he does. <laughs> Uh, you can't take all these things for granted. Sometimes there are things that you may deal with in your family. You may say, well, we've got this set in stone. But probably even in your own home, you have to revisit things you want your children to do a certain way. Or revisit things that you and your spouse had agreed on. Uh, teachers, if they have a classroom, they can't make their list of rules on day one and think by the day 180, everything's going to be just fine without talking about those list of rules. By the way, I recommend you don't have a lot of rules. Have four or five. We can't, we can't get the book of Deuteronomy out and enforce it the whole school year. Amen. But just have four or five simple rules and keep it, keep it simple. Amen. Like one of my rules, number one rule is don't mess up your good looks. People laugh at that, but that's a real rule. That's a real rule at my house and, and, and around here and anything else. Like, don't mess up your good looks. That will save you from doing a lot of ridiculous things. Amen. That's an all-encompassing rule. Well, let's get back to what the Lord says here. And this, this has, these things had to be revisited with these men. 
commit it to the Lord, following the Lord, no doubt about it. But he's talking to them about things ought to be doing. Let's move along. If you'll turn over to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 32, we begin we revisit this, these same truths given there under the pen of Matthew. Again, we're looking at what it says. I'll read what it says in verse 8, then go to chapter 10 of Matthew while you're turning there, he said, Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him the Son, uh, him the son of Man also conf uh, shall confess before the angels of God. Over in Matthew, we see some similar wording, but maybe a little, little, little uh, more revelation about what Jesus means when he talks about confessing us before the angels of God. Verse 32 of Matthew chapter 10, if you're there, say amen. amen. Jesus saying again, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. So no doubt is, is intent, intended that the word angels is given here, but, but, uh, but in that crowd of witnesses in heaven that Jesus will be testifying on our behalf, on the behalf of these men especially, would be God himself. Amen. Basically saying, if we deny Jesus, he's going to deny us. Uh, we're gonna, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. And that, that crowd, is, according to God's word, is going to include a lot of people who've done amazing things on this earth in the name of religion, maybe in the name of God, but they did not know the Lord. I don't even profess to understand that completely. It's a pretty fearful thing to think about, isn't it, for us that are serving the Lord to make sure that we're serving God the right way for the right reasons. But he's saying here, confess me before men, I'll confess you before God the Father and the angels in heaven. He says that we ought to confess the Lord. Over in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5, look here as we look at the end of the book again. And these, tides, these things are tied to Jesus' departure from this world, these truths that he's teaching, but they're also tied to the end of the age. They're tied to you and me. They're tied to what will, be, what will become of us as we serve God, just not, not just now, but in eternity. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5, again, a message to the church in Sardis, but it says here, in verse in in this uh, in this in this chapter here, I believe verse five here, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. That goes back. This is one book. God wrote this book. Amen. This is one book. God wrote this book. We see wonderful clues like that as we go across the pages of the book. I know there are sixty six books. I know I gave a trick question this morning, but this really is one book. Amen. Never forget that. There's too much evidence when you read scriptures like that that support one another and testify of one another. So to confess Christ, what? It means that we proclaim to others the fact that Jesus Christ is my Savior, that he's my Lord, and that my eternal salvation is from him and not from me at all, that I'm not living my life unto myself, but I'm living it unto him. You say, well, that seems to be a given for Christian people, but we all struggle at times to be the faithful witness, to confess Christ as we ought. I've jokingly said, but truthfully said at times, sometimes I've struggled just to get a gospel track out of my pocket to hand to a little, excuse me, a little 16-year-old girl who's the, who's the cash register at the grocery store. I think, oh, I don't know, I don't, maybe she's going to laugh at me. I, I don't know if you have those thoughts, but I have them occasionally. So that's foolish. She's going to be kind. She, oh, those lady, young ladies are kind. Young men are always kind, typically receiving these things. Very rare that people won't. And my job is not to worry about their reception, just to make sure that I have a confession. Amen. That I confess to them. Confessing is not, not just proclaiming, but it's a, by the way, it goes back to the root of, of our, even our life in Christ, is to agree with God. Confession and repentance very closely connected. We agree with God about ourselves. We agree with God also about who he is. Yeah, and we, when, we, when we confess before men our salvation, oftentimes for believers, it is, this is the New Testament teaching, we go back to Acts chapter 2, then they that gladly received his word were what class? They were baptized. I encourage you, if, you have, if you've been saved and not been baptized, you ought to be baptized. Amen. Uh, that, and, and, and I understand people taking time with their children, that's perfectly fine, but, but I say that if, if you've confessed your sin before God, it's time to get baptized, baptized scripturally by immersion, baptizo, dipped into the water completely and then brought up, identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, baptism is I've been taught and I've tried to teach other. we stand, others. We stand in the water, and the water goes across our body just like the cross that Jesus died. We go down into that water to identify with Jesus' burial, his death, and now his burial. We bring people up out of that water to identify with his resurrection. The mode of baptism is important as far as the truth of the gospel is concerned. Amen. We don't practice baptism by immersion just because it's a tra tra tradition. We practice it because it identifies clearly the truth of the gospel. Yep. 
Any other mode of baptism is not scriptural. It's just not scriptural. And so the word, we know what the word means. We know what it, it, the agreement with the gospel is. So as we confess Christ, I want to remind you again, that's initially typically done through baptism. And I encourage people, uh, as they get saved, I understand we work with our children, as I said a moment ago. But if, if you are a, of, of age and you know you've accepted Christ as your Savior, I don't think you have to go through tons of programs and wait a long time to get baptized. Get baptized. Solidify your faith in Christ with this public confession. Let people know you believe in the gospel and you believe Jesus lives in your heart and it will attach you to a local church that will help hold you accountable to the life that God's given you. There's so much hidden there. Confess. Confess the Lord before men. I would, I would say if someone would accept Christ, would make a prayer, but would refuse to be baptized, I, I personally, even though I'm not the judge of all the earth, would doubt whether they've truly been converted. Uh, because that's a, we ought to be willing to confess Christ before men. Baptism is, is very important. Thank God it's not required for our salvation. I was thinking again of that illustration this morning when we sang hymn number 131. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. I remember that thief on the cross didn't have to get off the cross and get into the baptismal waters to enter into paradise. And neither do we. That wonderful illustration that I heard a preacher that I listen to on the radio often, many times I say because of his accent, but I enjoy the truth of it as well. But he gave that beautiful, that beautiful illustration about, uh, really an allegorical illustration about a man, uh, the thief on the cross, leaving this world and spiritually arriving in heaven and arriving at the gates. And he knocks on the gate. They open the door and they look across the manifest there and they can't find this gentleman's name on the, on the list of people getting to heaven at all. And supposedly, according to this story, St. Peter says, we don't see your name here. Sir, why, why, should, uh, why should we let you in? Or what, what means? Uh, uh, are, you, are you a member of some church that we would know? Well, no, I, I wasn't a member of a church. Uh, Sir, uh, have you done anything uh, for Jesus and the gospel's sake while you're in the world? Well, no, sir, I, I really, no, I, I, I didn't do that either. Well, sir, well, for what reason should we let you into God's heaven? And he said this, all I know is the man on the middle cross told me that I could come. Amen. Jesus paid it all. Amen. All to him I owe. And we, if he, he died for us on the cross, no doubt baptism is not required, but we ought to make a public confession of the one who paid it all for us. Yeah. It's not required, but it's the, it is an, as a wonderful first step of obedience. We ought to confess him. And not only beyond that, our confession goes beyond just a prayer. It goes beyond just the baptismal waters. Our confession then goes with our, should go with our lives and with our words. You help me, class. If any man be, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new, new creature. And so when Christ comes to live in your heart, you're, you're going to have a different life. If you don't have a different life, you probably don't have salvation. You know, you can't add Jesus to what you're doing. Uh, the Romans that ruled in this day and age in the first century were syncretistic, no doubt. They wanted to, they wanted to take the religion of the conquered peoples and just kind of synthesize it into what was already there. They loved polytheism. It was a way for them to keep people happy with their religion, but to keep them under their thumb. Yep. But Jews and Christians wouldn't hear of that. They were monotheistic. That's well, why there was so much trouble in all, all, all of that. As we think about this, as we think about our life and our, our words, listen, we, we must stand up for Christ. He is the one and only. There's no other like him. He's the only way to heaven. And we know that, John chapter 14. But our life and our words, we should openly acknowledge that we're followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Truly, there is a different difference in our life. And if Jesus Christ has saved us, we're going to be a different person. We're, going to be, we're not going to be perfect, but we're going to be growing in God's righteousness. Isn't that true? We're going to be growing in our sanctification process. We're going to be growing in the love of God. We're going to be growing in our love and promotion of the truth. We're going to be growing uh, in, our, in the confession of our sins and even judging ourselves. And when opportunities come up to tell people of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to readily, even though we have a little fear in our heart, we're going to readily move forward and confess that Jesus is the one and only. He's the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus is saying to his men. There are going to be plenty of reasons for you to keep your mouth shut. That's what he's going to tell them. There's going to be plenty of reasons for you not to speak up. There's going to be potential harm in our, in our society, a little bit of ostracism, a little bit of embarrassment at the most. It doesn't even embarrass you to talk about being, being afraid to witness for Christ when you think about first century Christianity. I mean, it's embarrassing to think I'm, I would be nervous to hand a gospel tract to someone when people literally were fed to lions. When people were, were, were strapped to a stake and burned because they wanted a copy of the Bible in their own language. And then, uh, then I would talk about having a hard time giving a gospel tract to a 16-year-old girl at the, as a cash register. That, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I'm not fussing at you. I'm fussing at me. I mean, what, what does it come to? What does it come to? God, help us to be ready to confess 
The opportunities come up in gratitude. We speak of the Lord, and may God help us do that. Jesus said, if you want me to confess you before God, you're going to have to confess me before men. I want to remind you of this. We don't confess him so he will. We confess him because he will. You know, does that make sense to you? Because if you truly know the Lord, you know, listen, you're not going to keep that to yourself. It's going to break out on you, friend, as I like to say. It's going to break out on you. It's going to break out on you. Maybe, maybe the Lord has helped you change your speech. And it used to be at work when something bad happened, people could predict, or maybe they, maybe they took the odds on which four-letter word you were going to use this time. But, but now you've gotten right with God, and something happens. You say, well, hallelujah. <laughs> Something's happened to that fellow. Right. Uh, something happens. It's like, well, we're just going to have to pray about that. Something's happened in your life. Something's happened in your lips. You know what you're doing? You're confessing the Lord. Because you're confessing him, he's going to confess you. It's an outgrowth of true salvation. That's what the Lord is saying here. It's not works. It's not works, but it will happen. It will happen. And look here. So it says, I, I, I say unto you also, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But look, now to deny him, to be he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. De denial, what does that mean? It goes, it goes pretty far. And look into verse 10. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven the sin against the Holy Ghost, what some have called the unpardonable sin. Denying Christ is pretty serious. It goes pretty far. Uh, the, 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 again, denying Christ uh, carries, a, carries a strong sense of disowning him, of disowning him. Uh, again, as we, as we think about disowning uh, Jesus, it's hard to be believe that we could ever disown the one who would never disown us. By the way, if he's not going to disown us, we should never disown him. And if he doesn't disown us, we won't disown him if we're truly in the family. We're truly there. Jesus, again, is, 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 is talking about something very heavy here. You Name to me the most famous Christ denier in the Bible class. Peter. Wasn't Peter the most famous Christ denier in the Bible? Uh, maybe there are others, but I think he's the most famous. After Christ was taken into custody, so to speak, from the Garden of Gethsemane. And he'd already told Peter, what, you're going to deny me how many times? Three times. Did Peter, did Peter follow through with that? He surprised himself, but he did. <laughs> yeah. He surprised himself in a sense, but he did. But listen, I, I, this kind of denial of Christ that's being spoken of here goes well beyond this, this denials of Peter. Thank God Peter got right with God. Amen. Denial is more than words. Can I just say it that way? Right. Denial has a lot, is a lot more than your words. Peter in his heart was denying the Lord over his fear. But listen, denial is more than words. It's a pattern of life. For a person that claims to be a believing person. Only an unbelieving person will continually deny and disown the Lord Jesus Christ. False professors of Christ and, and real hypocrites will be flushed out or fleshed out in the future judgment by God who sees their hearts. Again, depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. Thomas Cranmer, I think I've, spoke to you, I've spoken to you of him before. He served as the Archbishop of Canterbury under King Henry VIII under Edward VI, and then, my goodness, under the reign of Bloody Mary. That was, a, that was a difficult time to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. No doubt about it. Henry VIII is pleading for, uh, for him to issue a, the, the, grant him the right of divorce. <laughs> Edward VI come to the, comes to the throne as a Christian young man, but doesn't stay there very long. And then Bloody Mary comes and comes to turn everything on its head as a just staunch Catholic. As Cranmer was there under the reign of these three people, it's very hectic. It is said, according, according to historical records, that when Bloody Mary came to the throne, that he was condemned, Cranmer was condemned to death for treason and for heresy, for his stand for what was right. In fact, I did not realize this until I read it, but he was forced to watch as Hugh Ladmer and Nicholas Ridley were burned at the stake in Oxford. He witnessed that with his own eyes. What was the goal of Mary as she eventually would kill 300 Protestant believing people in her reign, a short reign of only five years what was, what was her goal? To get people to deny Christ. Yep. Right. To deny Christ. Cranmer, as the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, was in fear of, of such a painful death. And that great fear of physical death. Remember this morning, don't fear physical death more than a spiritual death. And great fear of that, that physical death, Cranmer uh, recanted his views, his biblical views. And he signed a paper and he, that he agreed with the Roman Catholic view of transubstantiation. 
Now I remind you what that is. Uh, the, as we come to the Lord's table, we believe the memorial, uh, we'll come to the memorial supper, we have a juice, we have a bread, and we believe those are symbols of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are symbols. Transubstantiation teaches and believes erroneously and unbiblically that those symbols actually become the literal body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, Pastor, that's just a difference of opinion. I want you to know that's a deep doctrinal divide. I ask you, was the death of Christ on the cross, was it efficacious enough? Was it effective enough to forgive all sin for all time, past, present, and future? Yes or no, church? I mean, Christ Jesus is God, correct? See, this is not just a difference between two religious groups. This is a deep doctrinal divide. And so to say that those elements would literally be transformed in some miraculous or magical way into the body of blood and then ingested by us is almost is gross, number one. It's gross, number one. It's cannibalistic, excuse me, number one. Number, but number two, maybe, maybe I should say this is more important. It basically is our attempt to put Jesus Christ back on the cross because the work evidently wasn't finished. And so Cranmer there, took a, he had taken a stand against all of this in his role. But now in his fear of death, which you and I could understand, we, we, if I'd have seen Ladmer and really, Ridley die at the stake there, even though God used that in a miraculous way, I would have been shaken to my core. And he had recanted, he recanted. And he, but even though he recanted, and this is what happens, they, they planned to burn him at the stake anyway. <laughs> Might as well go ahead and take a stand. Easy to say, hard to do. On the eve of his execution, he was brought before the church was expected to acknowledge publicly his shift toward Rome and away from the truth. And, but, he, but he shocked his enemies when he suddenly renounced his recantation. He said, I have recanted, but I'm taking it back. I'm recanting my recanting. <laughs> that was a big deal. Amen. He declared the Pope to be the Antichrist. How about that? Amen. And rejected transubstantiation. Then, when it, with, a, with a light heart, the historian says, and a clear conscience, he allowed himself to be hurried to the stake amidst the outcries of his disappointed enemies. As the flames curled around him, so the historian wrote, he boldly held out his right hand into the fire, the hand that had signed that recantation that said, I, was, I, was, I recant my, the truth of the Bible and I'm going with Rome. He said, I'm going to put that hand in the fire first. This unworthy right hand, he said there, while he held his left hand up toward heaven as he perished in flames. Hopefully none of us will face that kind of torturous death. But listen, if God allows that in our life, and I don't want to make light of it at all. Sometimes we preach like we're not afraid of anything. We talk like we're not afraid of anything. We can, we can talk pretty boldly when we're you know, a couple thousand years removed from some of this, 500 years removed from some of this. These are real people who stood up for the Lord Jesus Christ. But if, if God does call us to that, or God forbid our children, or our grandchildren, that uh, we ought to be ready to confess Christ and not deny him in, under, even under such great pressure. And I say to this to you, that those truly who know the Lord will not deny him. They won't deny him. Someone has said, what is a little rejection or ridicule or even physical death in the light of the eternal life with our glorious Lord? May we boldly confess our loving Savior who bore our sins on the cross. Amen. He never turned on us. The Bible says here, again, Jesus says we ought to confess him. We ought not to deny him. And then verse 10, this denial goes even further. Whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man as I read a moment ago shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost that shall not be forgiven. What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Ghost? I, I say to you again, it, it takes this idea of denial a bit further. It takes the idea of denial much further. Now go back with me to Luke chapter 11, the previous chapter. The Lord Jesus is doing a great work. Verse 14, he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, he casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And the others, tempting him, sought a sign from heaven. And, and look down here in verse 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Because ye say that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. And if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your sons and, and uh, cast uh, them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Jesus here was being accused of doing the work of the devil when he was doing the work of God. 
Blaspheming the Holy Ghost is, is many times attributing the work of God uh, to the work of Satan in many regards. But the Bible says here, you may reject Jesus and be forgiven, but to reject the Holy Ghost is to be condemned. Yep. And again, what, what, is, what is being taught here, I want you to understand this. This is not a one-time single event, but this is a pattern of life over a lifetime that results in someone's physical death without their repenting and accepting Christ. And it will allow their soul to be cast into a devil's hell. Luke here is, 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 is trying to teach us something about what all this means. Whoever rejects the prompting of the Holy Spirit over and over and, and denies him and denies his truth in their life, where we remove ourselves, we remove ourselves, man or woman, from the only force that can lead us to repentance, that can lead us to new life in Christ, that can restore our position with God. And those who have seen the light and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and yet prefer the darkness of this world and the darkness of hell blaspheme the Holy Spirit. There's some thought even among theologians that, 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 that God in his, his convicting power will not always strive with us. The stories that I've heard and read throughout the ages, uh, through, through, down through the years, I should say, have had testimonies from the ages where people have, 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 have wanted to repent but did not sense God's convicting power in their life. I don't confess to understand that, but I know this. If we continually reject God, if we continually set our mind against him and the work of God, if we've been exposed to the truth and the Holy Spirit said, this is the way you ought to walk in it, and we reject God over and over and over and over, we will die and go to a devil's hell. I don't, you, should not, you should not fear the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit taking place in one instantaneous moment and you have an anathema written over your life. That would not align, up, that would not align with the grace of God. Right. That would not align with the mercy of God. There's some people in some religious groups, that's the way they live. They keep people hamstrung. They keep people in a tizzy. They keep people like they're fluttering on the brink of hell. That they could do something wrong at any moment, blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and their, their eternal life would be gone. That's not why God promises. We are, we are in the palm of his hand, John chapter 10, and no one can pluck us out. Eternal life is a biblical teaching, but this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is to resist his convicting work in our heart and in our life. This is a permanent condition unless we stop resisting. Amen. As long as there's life, there is hope. Yeah. Yeah. That's why you may fear for someone that says, they may say, I don't even know if there's a God. I want you to know if they're still alive, there's still hope. Amen. People say foolish things like that. Yeah. Everyone has their own journey to walk on. We pray. People say, I don't, there is no God. I want you to know that's a foolish statement to make. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Yep. But as long as there's life, there's opportunity for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So don't stop praying. Don't stop thinking that someone could be converted. Peter, again, I remind you, horribly <laughs> denied the Lord and was restored. Uh, but this is, this, is, this is what we understand. There's a difference there. The lesson for us is this. If the Spirit of God is tugging at our heart and working in our heart, my friend, do not resist him. Amen. Don't resist him. For salvation, for service, or whatever the matter may be, absolutely don't resist him. He's drawing you to the Lord Jesus, uh, but sin is luring you away. My friend, yield to the Lord Jesus Christ. If he's drawing you into his bosom for service and devoting your life to him in a full way of surrender, don't retreat from that. Run to him and line up with him and obey him. Sad, sad to say there, there are people throughout the ages who have, who have rejected God and have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And my friend, uh, they're in hell and they will be cast into the lake of fire. As we read about this morning. If you die without Christ, there's, there's no other hope. Many of you have heard of the French philosopher, the infidel, the infamous Voltaire. He once made a, a, a despicable statement about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said this, and I say only in quotations, but he said about our Lord curse the wretch he hated the name of jesus he hated the thought of jesus he hated the thought of the bible so i still argue even though this man died lost without god that statement did not guarantee his place in hell it was his it was his repeated rejection of christ until the day of his death that sealed his fate in hell as he sinned against the Holy Ghost. He proclaimed, he made this proclamation, within 50 years that the Bible would be forgotten and Christianity would be a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. These are the words. He said, I'll show how just one Frenchman can destroy it within 50 years. In 20 years, Christianity will be no more. My single hand shall destroy the edifice it took 12 apostles to rear. 
Man, that's, those are pretty bold statements. But you know what's interesting? 20 years after his death in 1778, the Geneva Bible Society purchased his home for printing the Bible and other Christian literature. How about that? And it later became the Paris headquarters for the British and Foreign Bible Society. By the way, you know what the best-selling book in the world is? The Bible. And it is reported, according to this article that I wrote, that, it said, wrote, uh, that I read, excuse me, I did not write it. That's for sure. There was one big footnote at the end of this, amen. An entire six-volume set of Voltaire's works once sold for only 90 cents. Peter McKenzie, a famous Methodist preacher, was being shown over Madame Tussauds waxworks in London and coming to one object, his guide said, this is the chair in which Voltaire sat and wrote his atheistic blasphemies. To which McKenzie replied, is that the chair, really? Then McKenzie, without seeking permission, he stepped over the cord, sat down on the chair, and sang the song with these words, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successful journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. That preacher had it right. Yep. Voltaire is dead and Christ, Christ's truth stand, his, stands, his word stands. You want to find what it means to deny Christ. You want to find what it means to really blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Let the name of Voltaire come to your mind. By the way, he had a tragic life. A physician that cared for him in his final days said this, When I compare the death of a righteous man, which is like the close of a beautiful day, with that of Voltaire, I see the difference between bright, serene weather and a black thunderstorm. It was my lot that this man should die under my hands. Often did I tell him the truth. Yes, my friend, he would often say to me, you are the only one who has given me good advice. Had I but followed it, I would not be in the horrible condition in which I now am. I've swallowed nothing but smoke. I've intoxicated myself with the incense that turned my head. You can do nothing for me. Send me a mad doctor. Have compassion on me. I am mad. This is Voltaire. Even though he's alive, he's in a state of refusing to repent. I say in a state of refusing to repent. His doctor, a physician, went on to say, I, can think, I cannot think of it without shuddering. As soon as he saw that all the means he had employed to increase his strength had just the opposite effect, death was constantly before his eyes. From this moment, madness took possession of his soul. He expired under the torments of, of, of the furies. The physician said, I cannot help but pause after writing these somber notes on Voltaire and be reminded of Paul's great truth that even the intractably rebellious infidel Voltaire will one day bear, bear, excuse me, bow before the precious Lamb of God and proclaim the truth of uh, Philippians chapter 2. What? Wherefore God hath also exa highly exalted him and hath given him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that, at, uh, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah. Jesus says, confess me to men. Don't deny me. You know what denial looks like? Maybe Voltaire is an extreme case. But I promise you, every person that's in hell today is living the life of a madman in their denial of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what Jesus, he's talking to his disciples. He's trying to remind them, don't you reject. Don't be afraid to confess me. To deny me is, is, is not the life you want either, my friends. But I believe he's also trying to turn their minds and motivate their hearts to the need of those they'll be preaching to. Their vast and great need of those we'll be preaching to. As we close our time out here very quickly, God willing, this evening, look, look what's happening here. He said, I want you to confess me no matter what. Don't deny me no matter what. Don't do that. And make sure that people don't deny me all the way to their physical grave, which will lead to a spiritual, eternal death. And then he says here to them, and when they bring you unto the synagogues. Let me ask you, class, uh, would you imagine that the gospel will be friendly and well-received in the synagogues? No. Those, what are synagogues? They're the place of worship for Jewish believing people. Pharisees were at home in the synagogue. The lawyers were at home in the synagogue. They had constructed a religious edifice that was not, was not tied to the true Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So going into the synagogue is going into the lion's den, right? It says, when, you, when, you go into the, when they bring you into the synagogues and went unto the magistrates, I don't think Peter and, Peter and uh, John had an easy time of it when they went before the Sanhedrin, did they? We'll read over in the book of Acts at some point uh, later on, I'm sure. You've read it before. As they were commanded against, uh, to their own, their own detriment not to preach Jesus Christ. And they said, well, we can only can obey God rather than man. Yeah. We can only speak the things we've seen and heard. 
But he says here, Jesus said, I want you to know that when it gets tough in the synagogue and when it gets tough before the magistrates and the powers, take you no thought or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what you ought to say. John chapter 14, would you go there with me for just a moment? He's preparing them for coming persecution. And he's telling them that the Holy Spirit is going to be with them. In this fourth gospel here in the book of John, the Holy Spirit is, is the favorite title of the Spirit, is the paraclete, the one that comes alongside us, mm -hmm. that helps us and enables us. Over in John chapter 14, verse 26, we look here, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom from the Father will send in my name, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. And it tells us here that when we get, when it comes time to confess and not deny, when, the, when it's against us and it's difficult, and we're, we're fearing persecution, we're fearing even ostracism in this current day and age, we're fearing the difficulty of standing up for Christ. This word tells us now in Luke 11 to stand clearly, let the Holy Ghost stand with you, and he's going to fill your mouth with the words you ought to say. Amen. People say to me every once in a while, I'd, I'd like to witness for the Lord, but I just don't know. I'm afraid I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> I was talking to even someone just recently talking about, I want to teach the Bible, but I'm afraid I might say the wrong thing. Listen, there's a promise here. Aren't you glad for this promise in Luke chapter 11? Look, and when they bring you into the synagogues and under the magistrates and the powers, take you no thought of how or what ye shall answer or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit working in you will put the words in your mouth? Amen. Now, that is not a reason not to study and prepare. So I say, that's good. I don't have to study anything. The Holy Spirit's just going to fill my mouth. Well, I think he's going to draw on the things that you have studied and God's put into your heart. But it is, it is amazing. I have I've heard the testimony of some of our brothers and sisters in this church when they've had witnessing opportunities. Pastor, it's amazing. As I, I begin to talk to someone about the Lord, verses begin to come to my mind that I memorized as a child or, 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 or some, something you said in a sermon or that I heard your dad say in a sermon came to my mind. You know what? The, word is, the Holy Ghost is working. Yeah. He's drawing on the deep well that God willing you have in your life and while you and I are fearing our physical demise and we're fearing just this, the ostracism that, that's taking place, the Holy Ghost is helping us. He's our helper. It's a wonderful thing, and, and we find that true over, look over in Acts chapter 4. Look over here with me. The Holy Ghost begins to help in this book of Acts. This book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles, but I, I was taught in seminary that it's really the, the, the continuing work of the Lord Jesus Christ in the person of the Holy Spirit. That's what's happening in the book of Acts. Jesus has not stopped working. And look over in chapter 4 and verse 8. What does it say here? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and ye elders of the people. He began to address the Sanhedrin with power. Mm -hmm. No doubt he was worried about what would happen to him. It, I mean, Jesus Christ had just been hung on the cross. And now he's standing there boldly in front of these men. Look over in chapter 30, verse 31 of chapter 4. Excuse me. And they, when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake. The word of God with boldness. That's what will happen. That's why we can confess Christ in difficult situations. Because yeah. the Holy Spirit will help us to be the teacher, to be the witness that we ought to be. He comes alongside us. He comes alongside us. Uh, thank God for that. Someone, one commentator said this. It was not the humiliation which early Christians dreaded, not even the cruel pain and the agony, but many of them feared that their own unskillfulness in words and defense might injure rather than commend the truth. It is, this, it is this promise of God that when a man is on trial for his faith, the Holy Spirit will make sure that the words of truth come forth. Yes. And this is a promise from the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, not a, not a reason for poor preparation. <laughs> Not a reason to not study the Bible and study the lesson and study the gospel and have a way of, of giving it faithfully, not just in a, as a robot, but faithfully giving the gospel and teaching the word of God. But listen, you don't have to have a degree behind your name. You just need the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. And thank God you receive the Holy Ghost at salvation. You can receive him at salvation and his power. One, one other, uh, another martyr's testimony that I read about in preparation for all this, but uh, it was a name, of a, a name I'd not heard before, Alice Driver, a lady 
a martyr at her examination before her before those who would who would take her life she put all the doctors to silence so that they had not a word to say but looked upon another and she said to them have you no more to say god be honored you be not able to resist the spirit of god in me just a poor woman so when the, so the chancellor condemned her and she returned to the prison as joyful as the bird of the day she would burn at the stake in 2 weeks before the end of bloody mary's reign but there, this poor woman who stood before the theologians of her day, they, they had no answer for her because the Holy Spirit helped her to stand up for Christ and to confound the wise. Amen. Listen, God will help you. Right. You and I aren't going before the Sanhedrin. We're, we're, not, we're not going be, uh, before, the, the, before those who would take our life. Sometimes we're just trying to witness to our family. You say, what am I going to say? The Holy Spirit will help us. Uh, there's no way I could teach that class of children. Listen, the Holy Spirit will help you. Yep. You have to prepare and do the work, but the Holy Spirit will help you. Absolutely. The paraclete will come alongside you, and you will be able to stand up for the Lord. Let's not live in fear. Let's live in faith. We can do that because of the power of the Holy Ghost in us. Yep. We, can, we can confess him before men. General George Patton said this when he was in, he was in Italy, in Sicily, Italy. He said, I have learned very early in life never to take counsel of my fears. We think of Patton as, as having no fear at all. But he's a man that accomplished much in the face of fear. And I don't hold him up necessarily as a Christian example. But I want you to understand, if a man of this world could operate that way, you and I can operate much greater in the faith of God and the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. He's living in you. Amen. Where is the power that Jesus promised? It's inside you. Amen. In the person of the Holy Spirit. We're not, to be, we're not to be controlled by fear and anxiety, but controlled by this truth. Listen, he says here as he's talking to his men, he says, don't live in hypocrisy. Don't fear this physical death. Look, I love you. I'm not forgetting you. You can tell me anything. I'm still going to love you. You can go through anything. I'm still going to be with you. Be bold enough to confess me before men. Don't deny me. And listen, don't let them, don't let them deny me until their grave. Preach the gospel so they, they will turn. They will turn. And I want you to know when you get in a hard situation, when it's really difficult, when you're up against it, you don't even know what to say, that the Holy Ghost will give you the power and the words to say, to preach and teach this gospel. I'm glad the Lord's given these important instructions to his, to his men. He's given them to us tonight. We can do God's work in this world. We can give the gospel. We can raise up the name of Jesus Christ. We can see people saved. We can see people added to this church because of the Holy Spirit working in us. Let's not use fear as an excuse. Not that, that we don't confess him. Let's don't use fear as an excuse to deny him. And let's do everything we can to stand between people in hell so that they don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost all the way into a devil's hell. God help us to stand firm and let the Holy Spirit work through us. Can we do that, church? Oh, I say we must. We must for God's glory and for the sake of the lost. Let's pray together. Lord, help us now as we can take these, these words and apply them to our heart. By God's grace, we can. We can. We can confess you. And help us to do that. Help us to never deny you, Lord. Peter was under all sorts of pressure. I've never been under that kind of pressure. It's easy to criticize that sort of thing. I've never been under that kind of pressure. I've never stared at a cross thinking that I could be hanging on it because of my belief in Christ. Lord, but even if I do, I pray you give me the faith to proclaim your name boldly. Lord, if I'm in a situation where I feel like I'm in over my head, and that happens often, where I'm in over my head, I don't know what to say, what to do, how to phrase it. I don't know how to stand up against those that don't stand with me. I, I don't know what to do. Lord, help me to remember the power of the Holy Spirit in me. I pray that everyone in the sound of my voice knows Jesus and has the Holy Spirit living in them. And if we do, we have the power to preach the gospel in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the, world, of the earth, Lord. And I pray we do it gladly and boldly. Help us surrender to you. Help us to live in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in our own power at all. We ask in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you would stand with me, please, in this hymn of invitation. It's a small chorus. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. They'll begin to play that, and the altars come open even now. I just encourage you to live in the power of the Holy Ghost. It'll make us a bold witness for Christ in the most difficult situation you can imagine. And we all need that. 
so that we don't shirk our duty to get this gospel to the world. Would you ask the Lord to help you to live in the power of the Holy Ghost? I mentioned a moment ago there are people who say there is no God. They don't know if there's a God. People you know talk like that and it concerns you. Maybe you'd like to come pray for them tonight or grab somebody and agree in prayer that you're going to be a witness and you're going to pray for their salvation. If you don't, I wonder who will. Don't just forsake them. There's still opportunity. While there's life, there's hope. Pray for your boldness. Pray for them to have faith. Pray that God would work. My friends, if we're just going to do it in our power, we're not going to accomplish anything for eternity's sake. And we can do a lot in our own strength, quite honestly. Too much. And we've done too much. God help us live in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's 168 in the hymn book. You may know it. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. And may God's Spirit fall on us. We need a feeling of the Spirit to be the Christians we've been saved to be. Don't walk out of here. If God's speaking to you, fall on your face. Ask God to help you. We'll sing it together. 168 if you need it. Lift your voice with us. Or come to this altar.